Uh, one of the great gifts God gave to humanity is the freedom to choose. He gave us a free will. And he, he loves us enough. He invites us to choose to, to serve him, to cooperate, to spend our lives with him and eternity with him. But God has been gracious enough to give us the privilege to choose to live our lives apart from him and to spend eternity apart from him. It's not punishment, it's our choice. We can choose the direction of our lives and the, the direction of eternity. That's an amazing gift God has given to you and me. We're not just brute beasts who lead our lives by instinct, meeting the cravings of our physical selves. God has empowered us with a will and the power to choose. It's an amazing thing. In Joshua chapter 24, that idea is highlighted. You remember Joshua? He's the, the leader that succeeded Moses. One of the toughest jobs in all the Bible. How'd you like to follow Moses? You know, Moses couldn't finish the job, and so God tabs Joshua and said, I want you to do what Joseph couldn't. I mean, what Moses couldn't. Excuse me? Moses came down the mountain with the Big Ten. Moses spent so much time in the presence of God, he glowed in the dark. And you want me to do what he couldn't? So I would say Joshua's got some pretty big shoes to fill. And this particular passage is coming nearing the end of Joshua's leadership. And remember with me, Joshua began his life as a slave in Egypt. In the brick pits of Egypt, he walked through all of those plagues. He came through the Red Sea on dry ground. He's made the journey through the wilderness. And when Moses is gone, Joshua leads the Hebrew people into the promised land. And now he's nearing the end of his journey. And this is his message to the, to the Israelites. It's Joshua 24. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Let's pause there just a minute. I want to ask you a question. It's a pretty simple sentence. Joshua said, throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Why do you suppose he would say that to the Hebrew people? I think there's only one reason. They still had the idols from Egypt. <laughs> Does that strike you as odd? This group of people has experienced the supernatural participation of God more than any other generation of people that have ever lived on planet Earth. Moses walks in out of the desert and the plagues start in Egypt. They come through the Red Sea on dry ground. They eat manna. God provides them food and water for 40 years. That whole generation dies. Their children are the ones that occupy the promised land. The, the first city they come to is Jericho. They march around Jericho and the walls fall down. They have been sustained by God, kept by God, given an inheritance by God for a period of decades. They're 50 years out of Egypt. And Joshua looks at them and says, throw away the gods your forefather worshiped beyond the river. Throw away the gods of Egypt. See, they've got a tabernacle. They have a holy of holies. They have stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on it. It's not that they've rejected the worship of God. They have just incorporated into that, assimilated into that, the worship of some other gods. They've got a backup plan. After all, maybe God won't come through. So we'll need one of those Egyptian gods to save the day. Before we shake our heads at them too much, it seems like we're a lot like them. Oh, we want to depend on God, but we got our backup plans. In case God takes a break, so I think we want to imagine that when well, we said a prayer and we got dipped in a pool, so we've got all of our God business done. Well, they've been through the Red Sea and they've eaten the manna and they have seen miracle after miracle and there's still a tug of war in their hearts. Can we be candid enough to admit there is a pull in our hearts that we don't always want to be godly? We have choices to make, folks. Being a Christ follower is not about a single choice. It's about a whole succession of choices. Much of the way that eating healthy, it's not about a single choice. Well, I ate healthy, it was six months ago today. <laughs> I had a clean day. I ate kale, chased it with some beet juice, and went sugar free. And I've been good to go for six months. No. And the same is true of our spiritual lives. Now watch what happens. Verse 15, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, 
we will serve the Lord. Do you think all the Israelites chose to serve the Lord? I promise not. It's very seldom a universal choice. But Joshua pushes it before them. It's a remarkable gift of freedom God has given to you and to me. We can choose to cooperate with him or we can choose to reject him. We get to choose. Now, there's one thing you cannot do, and that's you cannot dictate the terms to God on which you will follow him. We'll either cooperate with the terms he has presented or we'll choose to go our own way. Now, I want to suggest that God has placed opportunities before every one of us, that everybody in the room today, everybody listening today, everybody gets to hear this message today, God has placed choices in front of you, that every one of us, regardless of how long we've been Christ followers and how well we know our Bibles or whether we're just beginners, we're still processing that choice that Joshua handed to the Israelites. We're going to choose today what we're going to do, the kind of people we want to be, what the outcomes of our lives are going to be. It's not about membership cards or where we sat last Sunday. It's about our choices today. Now, I want to use Palm Sunday as the backdrop for understanding those choices a little better. Palm Sunday is the the day we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus came to Jerusalem many times. This wasn't the only time he came, but this day was different. The previous time or two he'd come to Jerusalem, he has come covertly. He really wasn't welcome there. He had antagonists there that would have done him harm. And so he has slipped quietly into the city outside of public view. But this last time he comes to Jerusalem before he is to be arrested, he comes in the midst of much ceremony, much celebration. And it's recorded in the Gospels. I brought two of the Gospel accounts. We're going to look at Luke and John as Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem. And the choices really begin for the inhabitants of that city. The choices that are going to be made over the matter of a few days are going to determine the outcome of that city for many, many, many years to come. I want to plant the seed that the choices you make with regard to God have an enormous impact on the years that are ahead of you. I want to invite you away from the notion that there's only one God decision to make, and then after that, it's pretty much yours to do. Our lives are defined by our God choices on a daily basis. John 12, the next day, a great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and he sat upon it. It was written by the prophets, O daughter of Zion, your king coming, seated on a donkey's colt. In verse 16, it says, at first his disciples didn't understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Let's pause there a minute. I find some hope in that. Remember the gospels are written after the fact. This wasn't written in real time. After these events had all taken place and Jesus had gone back to heaven, the disciples decided they needed to put the Jesus story down so it didn't get lost. And so John is writing this after the fact. And in that particular verse, there's a bit of a confession in verse 16. It's it's an admission on John's part. He said, listen, we really didn't understand what was happening that day. I mean, we were actors in the scene. And if you could see the video of it, we were there. But we didn't understand what was happening. He said it was only after the fact, after Jesus was glorified. When was Jesus glorified? What's that mean? After his resurrection. It was after after the whole thing had played out and we looked back, we understood what was happening that day. I find comfort in that. How many times in your life have you lived through a season and I really wasn't aware of all the things that were involved in that? I wasn't aware of God's protection. I wasn't involved in the consequences of the choices that were taking place. But now that I look back on it, I realize that God walked me through that. Anybody have that story in your life? Yeah, me too. Most of the time in the moment, I am far less than fully clued in, doing the best I know to process all the stuff coming at me. And that puts us in good company. We're standing right there with Peter and James and John and Mary and all the crew. His disciples didn't understand all of this. Verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Verse 17 is kind of an insertion into Palm Sunday. It's an explanation as to why there were so many people willing to turn out to to make these remarkable statements about Jesus. And it seems to be linked to what happened to Lazarus. Remember the Lazarus story? 
dead four days, already buried, the tomb already sealed. Jesus was out of town. He comes back and he says, I want to see where you buried him. So they go with him to the cemetery and then he asks something really odd. He says, can you open the tomb? You know the story. In the King James, they said, no, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> Not a good thing, this opening the tomb stuff. And Jesus said, nevertheless, open the tomb. He calls Lazarus out. Now, you may not know, but Lazarus lives in Bethany. Bethany is a village very near the crest of the Mount of Olives. If you're in the old city of Jerusalem, if you're on the temple, immediately east of the temple in Jerusalem is a, is a steep valley, the Kidron Valley. And if you come out of that valley, you climb the Mount of Olives. And right at the crest of the Mount of Olives, just opposite the city of Jerusalem, is Bethany, the little village where Lazarus lived. So the Lazarus miracle put Jesus on the map in Jerusalem. He could do all kinds of miracles in the rural parts of Galilee. That's a day's walk from Jerusalem, but, but Bethany's a, an easy half-day walk from the city. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, a lot of people knew Lazarus and knew the family and knew the story. And the story was told and retold and it stirred the city. And on this day, the streets are lined with people that know the Lazarus story because they want to see the man that was the instigator. We're all kind of calm about that. Just suppose you were invited to a funeral this week. And suppose while they're playing the prelude, before anybody reads a scripture or they read an obituary, while they're just playing the prelude, you hear a knocking from inside the casket. And the funeral director opens it, and whoever you've gone there to remember sits up. Hey, y'all. How many of you think you'd tell that story? I didn't see a single hand. Did you all just lie in church? You'd tell that story to everybody you know. You'd videotape. Most of you have your phones out. You wouldn't even be able to see. You'd be looking at it on your screen <laughs> if you weren't hiding behind the pew in front of you. Folks, the Lazarus story shook the city of Jerusalem. And on this, this day of this triumphal entry into the city, all the people have turned out to see Jesus. Look at verse 18. Many people, because they had heard that he had given them this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. You know, there is no Jesus story apart from miracles. There is no Jesus story apart from miracles. I don't want to step away from the supernatural. I don't want to diminish it. I don't want to limit my opportunities or yours. I want to be guilty of inviting God to do things in our lives that only God can do. Well, what if he doesn't do it the way I want to? He's God. I'm still going to invite him in. Parents, how many times have you failed to meet your children's expectations? Has that ever happened? They wanted to stay up later than you wanted them to, so you put them to bed. I bet there's a whole litany of, if I could interview them, they would tell me what poor parents you are. And yet you love them. You have their best interest at heart. You have wisdom and maturity and life experience they don't yet have, so they chafe against the authority in their life. I do that with God. God, I don't like the job you're doing. I don't like the way you're doing it. I don't like the timing with which you're giving attention to the details of my life. And I wish you would pay attention. And if you'll give me just a half minute, I'll help you out, God. Sounds like, like a little child talking to their parent, doesn't it? Absolutely, I need chocolate before dinner. No, I don't want vegetables. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Look at verse 19. The Pharisees said to one another, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. On the Mount of Olives that day, there's a very clear line of demarcation. There are dozens and dozens of people giving praise and glory and honor to Jesus. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And then there's the Pharisees, grumbling and complaining, not participating. They're not about to make that choice. You see, they already have a position. They already have a little bit of power. And they have no intention of yielding to Jesus. 
And because they're not willing to yield to Jesus, they're not going to acknowledge Jesus, and they're certainly not going to worship Jesus. Folks, that line of demarcation is still drawn right through every community that hasn't changed in the first century to the 21st century. You've already gone ahead to Luke. I heard you. <laughs> Let's see the way Luke tells that day's events. Verse 29, as Jesus approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there. No one's ever ridden it. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. So they went ahead and found it just as they'd told them. And they were untying the colt. The owners asked, why are you untying it? The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. There's those miracles again. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You see, it, it seems pretty simple to us, but in a Roman world, if you were publicly proclaimed a king, you're a threat to Caesar. And you've just put yourself as a challenge. You've given the Romans a reason to execute you. So it's no simple thing to come into the city of Jerusalem, a Roman-occupied town, and have the general public lining the streets saying, here comes our king. Tense days in the city. Tense days in the city. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Make them hush. And Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Makes me smile, Jesus. He doesn't seem afraid, does he? Doesn't seem intimidated or threatened. Fellas, if I make the people be quiet, all creation's going to burst forth. I don't think Jesus was speaking metaphorically or in some figuratively, figurative way. I think if the people had been quiet that day, all of creation would have shouted. There's some biblical evidence for that. I'll take you back to the, the events around Jesus' birth. Remember the, the story? He was born in Bethlehem, and the city could have cared less. They didn't even have a room for him. There was no space. You can stay in the barn. The power brokers in Israel could have cared less. In the king's palace, nobody cared. In the temple, nobody cared. The high priest didn't care. None of the priests seemed to have any interest at all in Jesus. Nobody cared. In fact, the only record we have of anybody showing any peculiar interest in Jesus' birth was the, these strangers from a distant land that had made a long journey to worship this newborn king. But nobody in Bethlehem cared. So when it was time for Jesus' birth announcement, nobody wanted to hear it. Now, it wasn't made in secret. The prophets have told of the coming of Messiah. Dozens and dozens and dozens of passages told hundreds of years earlier, the people are waiting for the arrival of Messiah. Jesus fulfilled all of the passages and nobody cared. So God decides he'll make an announcement. And he sends an angel to tell the shepherds out in the fields near Bethlehem. There's a twist of irony in that. You see, in the first century, the shepherds uh, were the lowest rung on the social ladder. Shepherds were on the fringes, the margins of society. They weren't even allowed to testify in a public trial or public debate. So God chooses to make his birth announcement to the one group of people who aren't credible for a public announcement. And he sends an angel and he says, today in the city of David, the Savior is born. Remember the story? But then it tells us that all of a sudden the sky was filled with the heavenly host, that the angels of heaven filled the sky and said, we bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Heaven couldn't contain itself. I think of that image when I hear Jesus on the Mount of Olives that day. If these people be quiet, the rocks are going to take over. There are some announcements we're not even clever enough to make. We have to, they have to be delivered to us. Now, on the Mount of Olives that day, there were choices being made. And I believe there's still choices being made. There were people willing to give honor and praise and glory to Jesus because of who he was and what he had done. And there were people demanding that they be silent. Sounds a lot like the world that we live in, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like the world that we live in. We'll praise athletes. We'll praise musicians. 
We'll praise politicians. We'll praise business people. We'll give glory and honor to all kinds of people. We'll make heroes out of people that do perverse things. We'll celebrate people for the fact that they're nothing more than they're celebrated. If you can get enough followers on Instagram, we'll make a hero out of you. We don't even know what you are or what you've done. But we are reluctant to celebrate Jesus. Because it's not just a logical thing. It isn't just an intellectual process. There's a spiritual component to it. And I want to invite you today, more fully than you've ever considered before, to determine to be a person who gives glory and honor and thanks to Jesus of Nazareth. He's changed our lives. I want to suggest, you can give the Lord a hand. I want to suggest to you that worship, truthfully, is an expression of wisdom. When you're willing to give thanks to God, you are letting the wisdom that you have just leak out of you. Now, I'm not talking about a worship service. I'm not talking about musicians and vocalists and a particular style of music or even a location for music. I want to submit that worship begins with an attitude of the heart. And it finds expression through our whole person, through our words, our attitudes, our activities. Worship is about who we are 24-7. I've observed in my own heart and in the lives of other people that typically we will serve whatever it is we worship. Whatever you, hold, you attach high enough value to that you're going to give this kind of great credibility to, you'll serve those things. It could be a hobby. It could be pleasure. It could be a lot of things. So if worshiping God seems um, less than attractive to you, something you're not really that interested in, I'm just going to ask you to reflect a little bit. Think about the value attached to that relationship. The degree to which you truly want to please him and you want his best in your life. Are you really willing to serve him? Or what are you serving? Those are kind of intrusive questions. And we're all in church, so we all know the right answer is Jesus. But really, what are we really serving with our lives? What are our great aspirations linked to, our dreams linked to? What are our hopes tied to? What causes us to be agitated if it seems like it's going to be delayed or, or removed or diminished? Those are all ways to kind of unpack what really has that central place in your life. You see, the Israelites could have a tabernacle and a, and a place to worship and a holy of holies and an ark of the covenant long before it ever got lost and Indy looked for it. They could have all of those things but still have the Egyptian idols and the Egyptian gods with them. And you and I, we can sit in church and participate in all the things that church presents, but our hearts still be a long way away from the Lord. I don't want to do that. I don't want you to do that. Worship is an expression of wisdom. In Psalm 66, in verse 1, it says, Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. It intrigues me that verse 3, it says, say to God, don't just think it, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. God, you do remarkable things. And then the psalmist says that we should say to God, your power is so great that your end of enemies cringe before you. The skeptics say, well, that's not true. His enemies don't cringe before him. I disagree. Seems to me that all over the world, there are people saying, don't you mention that name of Jesus here? We don't want to hear about that. You can go in the public square here, you can talk about yoga. You can talk about Eastern mysticism. You can talk about economic power, or political power, or ideological power. You can talk about all kinds of things. Just don't talk about Jesus. Well, why not? We don't want that topic coming up. I do. If I'm coming, I'm going to talk about my friend. Do you know, I don't care about where you go to church. Tell, let's talk about Jesus for a minute. How do you know him? What's he done in your life? How would your life be different if you didn't know him? What would you do if you couldn't rely on him? You don't know him? Well, you could. I heard an interview on television last night between a couple of folks that I enjoy listening to. And one of them said he thought his chances of going to heaven were about 20%. And this was not a spirit, it wasn't a Christian show. And the, the, the guy talking to him said, I can help you with that. 
He said, for real, Charles, you can get your ticket punched right now. And boy, you could feel the tension on the, in the studio start to crackle. Because what had been a sports program all of a sudden turned the corner into something completely different. Jesus. The psalmist said, your, your enemies will cringe before the power of God. Folks, don't wait for the secular world to catch up with that. We've got to believe in the power of God. He's changing us. We're not here just to pretend we're better. We're a work in progress. Hmm. Jesus' followers in the book of Acts, when they were confronted with pushback, with threats and acts of violence and arrest, they prayed that God would give them boldness. Well, that's my prayer for you and me, that in this season, the Spirit of God would give us boldness to be advocates for Jesus. Let's pray before we go. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus, and I pray that you'll give us boldness to be advocates for Him through the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.